I'd like to ask you both, you know, normally do you see the sequence of cladribine followed by rituxan or cladribine with rituxan, and most of these patients are pancytopenic when you encounter them. My understanding is that the CD20 coat on Harry cells is probably about the heaviest of any of the B cell malignancies. <laughs> why don't, given the fact that you're pancytopenic, why don't you, um, why don't you start oh, first with, um, uh, with rituxan and then come in with cladribine with rituxan? Jackie or Jay? Sure. Oh. So you mean that your question is why don't we start with the rituximab <laughs> first and then get cladribine combination? Right, uh, since it's less marrow suppressive. Yeah. So I mean, I think um, you know the, the role of a rituximab I think is evolving. In I mean, there's many trials and many patients have received rituximab as well. And and then that we even though there are trials ongoing, I wouldn't say it's a considered to be a standard that all patients are receiving cladribine rituximab in combination. Um, just to be clear, that you know, the, even though we are we do see higher MRD negativity rate at the end of the day, there's no, no data to go for survival benefits. So it's not mandated that we have to give a rituximab combination the first line therapy. Although we do often think about them in those special situations, the pancytopenia patients. We do, I do wonder. I personally haven't done that. I think those could be a, as reasonable approach. We don't know the right sequence. Uh, what the timing of a rituximab? I know the NCI did a study with a concurrent cladribine rituximab versus a sequential uh, cladribine rituximab about a month later. So uh, there are. Uh, I don't think the data has been presented. I don't know the exact result of the data, the randomized study of the kind of combination to see whether there's an optimal the sequence or the timing uh, to get the vaccine benefit. But I think that's a uh, kind of the approach that we could take. Actually, in those patients, and I actually recently had a case of the 77-year-old newly diagnosed Harris leukemia, which is rare because the median age is you know, the, a lot younger than that. So, but then he presented with a, uh, a, a lot of other comorbidities and the pancytopenia, no infectious complications yet, but obviously certainly concern. Those patients that, uh, I think those are the patients that we are, that we enroll to them over, you know, just maybe in combination because the Vemirafinib, there is no further cytopenia these patients do get, so there's no kind of the dip down of a normal hematopoiesis. They don't, their counts actually recover from the where they start, so there's no dipping down, it's only go off from where we start. So actually we thought it was a good combination for them to do, and hopefully it will present to be a good combination, but we'll see. But I think other options might have been the rituximab, uh, or starting with the rituximab to see you know, this frail, especially the frail patients. Yeah, I, I don't see a reason why not consider it, but we don't have enough data. Unfortunately, we have more drugs than patients for, for this disease. Um, it's, it's one, like you said, I haven't seen the data from Dr. Kreidman either of sequential versus concurrent. Um, I think at the end of the day, what they'll find is that it's concurrent is better than sequential, just like they did with um, FCR and FR in CLL. But it might be different, you know, different diseases. But sequential usually more bang for your buck. What we do is uh, monitor them closely. If there's a concern for infectious diseases, we choose pentostatin instead because at least we can um, titrate it lower and give it more infrequent or hold the doses instead of like giving cladribine frontline. Yeah, we have some questions again to uh, the audience. <clears throat> Guideline preferred treatments for patients with hairy cell leukemia we have progressed after relapse include all of the treatments below except vemuratinab plus rituxin, moxitumumab <coughs> pseudotoxin, moxitumumab pseudotoxin <coughs> plus amonis rituxin, and abrutinib. Let's see what your answers are. All right. And let's see what the answer should be. 31%. Um, we could have done a little better. A commentary from Jackie, <coughs> Jay. The data has it hasn't been it hasn't been studied that combination. No, oh, just by itself, exactly. Yeah. All right, next question. A 42-year-old female with asymptomatic pancytopenia, white count 2.1. Uh, absolute neutrophil count of 600, platelet 75,000, hemoglobin 10.5, splenomegaly two centimeters below the costal margin, no other comorbidities, bone marrow is a dry tap. Uh, IHC shows that it's CD5 negative, CD10 negative, CD11, 11C positive, and CD whatever. <laughs> I guess that's 20, I would gather. So, the CD20 positive. Wow. Yeah. 
So what would you do? Would you watch and wait? Would you use cladribine plus or minus for toxin? Vemurephanatum <laughs> plus or minus for toxin and amoxitumumab plus uh, pseudotoxin? What would be your choice? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, I think this patient is probably significantly uh, neutropenic uh, to warrant uh, giving treatment. Uh, Jay, what do you think? Uh, so, we're just, uh, so, I mean, I think the first thing is that these patients, uh, this patient, uh, I think the watching with the 26% of the, uh, that one probably, I think we can all agree, uh, we uh, should agree that these patients need therapy, um, significant thrombocytopenia, although not requiring transfusion at this time, but this patient at this stage will soon require them. So before they do, I think this is the optimal time to intervene with a the therapy. So the one thing is that this ter patient need a therapy. So I think that's an important point to recognize what, what, what time point is it, but this is it. I think the combination of the therapy, clodumab plus or minus rituximab, is the current standard. I'm mean, uh, encouraged that there are 23% of the, uh, you guys chose vimurafenib plus rituximab. So hopefully, so someday may be an option, but at this time, it's investigation yeah, therapy, so just to be clear, right. experimental therapy. So we only do that in, uh, in a part of a clinical trial. So I want to take this opportunity to emphasize that I'm excited about it. But again, at the end of the day, it's experimental therapy, and the data hasn't been uh, published just yet. But maybe right. those 23 percent can refer them to you, right? Yes, if you do have those <laughs> patients who need a kind of the looking for chemotherapy-free options, it's an ongoing study. So we have a kind of the, about more than halfway through. So we will probably close the study sometime next year. So if you do have them, more than happy to see them and uh, refer, please. Dr. Connors, you have a question? Yeah. So um, our experience at, at home in the province of British Columbia where we've had a chance to watch patients for a long period of time, reaches all the way back to the interferon era. And so what we've noticed, as you commented on, I think, in one of the presentations, um, is the frequency with which these patients eventually can develop diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, hmm. a, a late complication. And I wondered, uh, we've also observed that this turns out to be um, exquisitely sensitive to standard treatment with CHOP plus rituximab. So the patients actually do fairly well. But I wondered if you might make a comment because it seems as though having seen this emerge after a variety of different treatments, including ones that didn't include uh, a purine analog or a cytotoxic agent, that perhaps it is actually more related to the natural history of the disease. And if this doesn't also affirm the necessity for these patients to remain in in long-term follow-up with a hematologist who's going to be prepared to recognize and then intervene for the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So I wonder if these patients that developed the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma had their IGHV mutation status tested? Because um, at least in CLL, patients that have the IGHV mutation with a 434 positive, they end up developing, um, they have a much higher risk of developing a Richter transformation into diffuse rich recent lymphoma. So it, it's possible that maybe those patients are enriched for that mutation. The other mutation that may be seen in Harry's leukemia variant is 17p deletion in up to a third of the patients. And those patients also in CLL may end up developing or have a much higher uh, probability of developing a deep transformation into diffuse rich recent lymphoma. So the gen you know, genetic molecular changes of those patients would be very interesting to, to see or study. Uh, we haven't had the opportunity to look at the immunoglobulin uh, heavy chain mutational status, but we have been able to look at the subtype um, <clears throat> in terms of light chain expression, mm -hmm. and there's a match there. So we do think it's derived from the original disease. The <clears throat> um, other question I had, though, was what about the... Um, the, the frequency with which these patients have good responses to treatment. Have you also noticed that? I haven't seen responses to the transformation to the LBCL. I, I haven't. I don't have experience on that. Yeah. <coughs> I think the 434, the, immuno, the heavy change in actual rearrangement is actually interesting because those are the patients, in the, even in the classical hair cell leukemia, those are high-risk patients, and those patients are the ones who do actually do not carry BRF, uh, characteristic BRF mutation. Mm -hmm. So I think it is uh, in, the, in unusual cases of the in the variant in classical hair cell leukemia, which is not always easy to distinguish them, unless you have a really good uh, hematopathologist to look at them. CD25 is one of the easy markers, but uh, even that may not be always that re uh, reliable. So I think that mutation analysis in some cases, in addition to BRF, could be helpful to dissecting those out. Dr. Abram. Hi, Tom Hoverman, Mayo Clinic. A couple of comments and a question. So in variant hairy cell leukemia, I've been around be since before that was ever described, <laughs> and the, uh, uh, we took some spleens out, 
in those patients with splenectomy is done incredibly well long term, and if you could comment on that in a minute. Secondly, with regard to Mort's comment, we actually did an interferon followed by penistatin trial back when we were doing the interferon <laughs> penistatin trials. And we gave interferon for three months with the concerns of the cytopenias. It really didn't seem to make much difference, and I think monocytopenia is the real problem here. And I'd be interested to know what the toxicities look like with monocytopenia. And uh, so those are my, uh, my, my two. Uh, well, then lastly, you haven't commented on interferon yet this morning, but in patients who relapse refractory disease, the drug still works. That's back in the old days, yeah, yeah. Dr. Haberman. <laughs> that was the days. I'm just a country doctor, Chicago, Dr. Right? Dr. Morton. Just a country doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Any commentary, uh, Jackie? So interferon, yes, it's still part of the NCCN guidelines. It's uh, if you have a patient that you think has too many comorbidities to be um, eligible to a purine analog, or um, it's it's an alternative. The only problem is that. Uh, time in remission, it might just be a short period of time in remission. In terms of the heresy leukemia variant or why splenectomy may work is because most of those patients present with very large screens and maybe the infiltration of these malignant lymphocytes might be there. Uh, that's my idea, but I just don't know if you have any other thoughts. I mean, we, I, mean I don't have a personal <laughs> experience, but I trained with Marty uh, Tolman, and who obviously is a, you know, the best experience with the heresy of leukemia, uh, and then kind of the, uh, and also using interferon in his days, and then splenectomy. So what I actually was uh, learning, although I never, because uh, we rarely do splenectomy for these patients, mm -hmm. so kind of one interesting thing about the heresy of leukemia that, uh, that I learned uh, from him is that splenectomy itself can actually uh, normalize the cytopenia of these patients, not only just the platelets, but other cytopenias as well, and that these patients can actually uh, be observed and can maintain that the clinical remission for a long period of the time. So we do, I know that's been uh, described and it's been seen, but I think splenectomy, having said that, because of, perhaps because of some of these options, so we rarely will think about them as a frontline therapy, but. Uh, it, or in refractory hair cell leukemia variant, as we do have a one patient who actually went through many therapies, but it did come up, but because of his age and comorbidities, we didn't do it. But I do agree that there could be an option for these patients. What about monocytopenia with the new agents? So <coughs> monocytopenia, so we didn't look as uh, rigorously, perhaps we will develop the, uh, the monotherapy, the patients, and we'll look at them in the frontline patients as well. We are looking at the T-cell recovery for that subset because one of the interesting findings is the, the immune, kind of the immunosuppression uh, with a non-pure uh, analog-based therapy. So monocytopenia, but uh, although we haven't looked at it rigorously, that we do see the recovery in about con uh, kind of four to six weeks after as the rest of the cell cancer recovers. So we haven't seen the prolonged mon monocytopenia. I mean, when they present, they often are monocytopenic, but they do uh, seem to recover with the other uh, kind of the immune recovery uh, with the vemurafenib at least, but um, that's just our personal experience so far. We have a question here. One would expect to have a higher percentage of CR with vemurafenib uh, uh, mirroring CML in the TKIs. In other words, you would expect to have a higher response. Uh, which are the mechanisms explaining disease on top of BRAF mutations? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I would have also thought so too when we designed the study that we're kind of excited that single agent might be um, because, you know, the one chemotherapy can reduce uh, the hair cell leukemia and a kind of unique disease that, you know, the repeated course of the chemotherapy can induce a, such a kind of uh, the frequent remissions in these patients and they do well for so long. Uh, I do not know whether the, uh, which other mutation uh, is involved, but we, we do know that even with the vemurafenib uh, at 960 milligram twice daily dosing, we, uh, we are never getting rid of the disease completely, and we do know the MAP kinase pathway is still activated. So uh, we're not shutting down the pathway completely enough, so I think that's actually the one reason because all the whole exome sequencing that we have done for the pretreatment and at the time of relapse for these patients and the response, we haven't seen any uh, resistance pattern that it will explain the kind of the rising of the, uh, the clone, and then they respond again to vemurafenib, although not completely. So I think it's just a matter of not shutting down the pathway enough. Having said that, as a subsequent therapy, I think not only us and others have looked at uh, what about if you com combine with a MEK inhibitor, it's just like the same thing as a REP plus MEK inhibitor, then are we going to uh, shut off the pathway more completely and get into better response? 
So those trials also have been done uh, as a part of the basket studies and also dedicated to hair cell leukemia. Interestingly, the response rate actually did not, that, uh, did not differ that much from the monotherapy, but in combination with the rituximab CD20 antibody is the time that led to a much deeper response. So maybe simply they do need to kind of the two different mechanism of action in combination. And that's the reason that we're taking that combination, not the MET combination in the frontline approach though. You know, the hairy cell variant is really a problem, and yeah. clinically they are slightly different, a bigger spleen and some nodes. <coughs> but in the laboratory, is the only way you distinguish them by CD25? Is that correct, Jackie? The variant? Uh, um, in the laboratory, how would you, you do a bone marrow and you get back hairy cell leukemia. So they how would you distinguish the variant from the uh, non-variant, the classic type? Is it just strictly uh, the CD25? Uh, also, the immunohistochemistry for BRAF, it's not there for the variant. Um, you have that, you have to do some molecular testing too. The um, IGHV unmutated, many of them are unmutated. Um, then there's the MAP2 K, MAP2 P K1 that can be present in many of those patients yeah, too. It's a molecular. And the other one is TP53 mutation that is also present. So mostly are molecular more than, um, more than immunohistochemistry findings. And right. lastly, uh, Jay, could you tell us about the toxin that's attached to moxitumumab? Pseudomonas. Uh, what, is it a diphtheria toxin? It's a, yeah, so it's if, I thought it was a pseudomonas, actually. Uh, is it pseudomonas, pseudomonas or diphtheria? Toxin, yes. Pseudomonas? pseudomonas, yeah. Okay, so that's the reason why they say that uh, there was a concern initially that if you had history of pseudomonas and you had right, antibodies, yeah, it might not work. Yeah, that's what the antibody would neutralize it. I mean, in that paper, actually, <coughs> the vast majority of these patients actually did have a pre-existing antibodies, but despite that they did response, I guess, mm -hmm. so, so one thing we don't know is that even they may have an antibody pre-existing, but the response rate did not seem to that differ uh, based on the antibody. Uh, if there are no other questions from the audience, uh, for our speakers, if not, I'd like to thank them for getting us not only on time, but getting through a little bit <laughs> early. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.